All right, let me uh, invite you guys to find a Bible, turn it on, whatever you have to do to uh, behold God's Word together. That's what we're, we're aiming at here, and we're in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 3, our text this morning, verses 1 through 10, as we continue our study of uh, this great book of the New Testament. So, as you turn there, uh, let's pause and let's ask God for His help to understand. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and for this opportunity together to draw near to you through your word, and Lord, for this opportunity for us to hear from you. We know all scripture is breathed out by you and profitable for us. It is is preserved by you and recorded without error, and we are grateful, Lord, that this is The authority over our hearts and lives is your word. And so we're asking, Lord, for your Holy Spirit to come and I pray to speak through me. And also, Lord, to open up the ears and eyes of the people here in this place. That we would see your son and understand the depths and the beauty of the gospel of Jesus. And we pray that you would transform our lives accordingly by the power of your word. We pray this for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, reading from Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. This is what Luke writes. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour, and a man lame from birth was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called the Beautiful Gate, to ask alms of all those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up. And immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk. And entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God and recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. For those who have ears to hear, let them hear the truth of God's word. All right, we're going to play a little game here. I'm going to start a sentence and you finish it. You ready? It's easy. All right. W- when the cat's away. Ah, okay, so you, you, you know this. All right, the mice will play. What does that mean? Um, out of sight, out of mind. It means when when the authority is gone, whoever that authority figure is, whether it's a parent, a teacher, a boss, whatever, when the authority is gone, uh, we will do whatever we feel like. Is that that accurate? We will do whatever we feel like. Uh, It's really just another illustration of the depravity of man. Okay? So when I was in college, I worked this summer at a Lowe's distribution center. And I realized uh, my first night, it was night shift, uh, that when the boss was not around, that merchandise was mishandled. And when I say mishandled, I mean shockingly mishandled. I, I witnessed many a smashed toilet, okay? And I learned that when I go to the store, when you pick up a box, you got to give it a little rattle to make sure that it, it sounds like it's intact. Um, another example of this uh, came from my youth, my childhood. I won't say how old I was, but when my parents first trusted us to be home alone, uh, my, my brother, he's an older brother, and myself, we had a favorite thing we would do. We would play football in the, in the house. <laughs> and to let you know how smart we were, our two touchdowns were the two cast iron radiators that flanked either side of the room. 
And when I say we played football, we played tackle football. And it was not strange for us to be diving for the radiators. By the grace of God, we didn't have any issue with the radiator. But on one occasion when my parents left us, uh, my brother did something to irritate me, and I bit him. Breaking the skin. And when my parents came home, they had to take him to the hospital, and they gave him a tetanus shot. <laughs> Which lets you know what your, my parents thought about me. <laughs> so... My brother did not appreciate that very much, as you can imagine. Our flesh, though, when, when, when the parents are gone, when, when the teacher's gone, I, you know, that, that's when we're going to just do whatever we feel like. When the boss is away, we're just going to do what we feel like because that's in our sinful nature. That's what we do. We take the foot off the gas, right? But what about when Jesus leaves his church? He was sent, we studied it. He ascended into heaven. Jesus just left them. Did the... the church to the apostles saying all right guys he's not he's gone we're good right is was that their attitude how did they act human nature tells us people get slack they get lazy when the authority the leader leaves but the early church does not do that in fact their ministry grows in zeal and in power now how do we explain that well jesus did bodily leave his apostles but who did he send he sent his Holy Spirit, right, in his place. And through his Holy Spirit, Jesus began to change our nature and the nature of his people. He changes our desires, he even changes our impulses. And so we need to go back and remind ourselves of Luke's introduction. If you go back to chapter 1, verse 1, you remember Luke mentions his gospel. The gospel of Luke was his record of what Jesus began to do and to teach. And by implication, we've been saying in our study of Acts that this is the record of what Jesus continued to do and to teach from where? From heaven, right? He is still continuing to work and to teach. And we often draw this very sharp distinction between Jesus' work on earth when he was here in the flesh and his work today, like it's some different thing. And it's not different. Okay, that's a mistake. Jesus is still at work in a powerful way on this earth. Jesus is still teaching his disciples today on this earth. And we see that in our text, which details the first, I'm going to call it the first post-ascension miracle of the church. Okay? First post-ascension miracle of the church. What do we have here? We have a healing we have a healing. Peter and John perform a significant healing with a man who was born lame. Could not walk from birth. And in our text, Jesus demonstrates his identity and his authority by healing people through his apostles. Jesus demonstrates his identity and his authority by healing people through his apostles. We are going to study three lessons from the church's first post-ascension miracle. Three lessons from the first post-ascension miracle. The first lesson we learn, Jesus' ministry continues. Jesus' ministry continues. At the end of chapter 2, Luke gave us this beautiful summary of what the early church was devoting themselves to do. And specifically, he says how they devoted themselves to the apostles. Apostles teaching, right? He, they devoted themselves to the apostles teaching to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayers. And in verse 43, look back at chapter 2, verse 43, it says that awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And so that was a general summary statement, but what Luke gives us next is a specific detail of one of those wonders and signs that the apostles were doing. So I want you to remember that this is descriptive, not so much prescriptive, for us, okay? The apostles were empowered to do wonders and signs. Why? Why, why, aren't, why aren't I healing people every day? Right? Why were the apostles empowered to do these wonders and signs? It was authenticating the gospel, the message that they were entrusted with from Jesus. 
And so in reality, it was Jesus who was working through his apostles. So look at verse 1. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. One of the habits we saw last week, the early church was in the habit of doing, was they were still going to the temple day by day. Okay? And we see it here. Peter and John are going to the temple at the hour of prayer. It's the ninth hour. It's three o'clock in the afternoon. This was the hour of the evening sacrifice or the afternoon sacrifice. And at this time when the animals were being sacrificed at the temple, faithful Jews, pious Jews would gather at the temple and have prayers. So look at verse 2. And a man lame from birth was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that's called the beautiful gate, to ask alms of those entering the temple. And so as Peter and John are going to the temple, we're introduced to this man who we're going to find out is over 40 years old. We see that in chapter 4, verse 22. He's over 40, okay? And he is being taken to the temple every single day. He is not able to walk. He was born lame, so he is taken to the temple every single day to do what? To ask for alms. Right? To ask for charity, money to the poor. That's what alms are, money to the poor. And they would lay him at the gate that's called the beautiful gate to ask for alms from the temple goers. Why would you go to the temple to ask for alms? Well, the Jews understood that giving to the poor was an important part of their faith, a part of their religion. It was a pious action of the Jews to give to the poor. And so if you are a person who is impaired, who needs to beg for your money, then you're going to go to the place where the pious Jews are gathering, right? People on their way to worship God are more likely to give money to the poor than people on their way to Target. Just saying. So it makes sense, right? This is a place, it's strategic, it's where you're going to get the most money. And so this man would have no other income. This is it. His job was being laid at that temple gate and begging. And he couldn't afford to be shy about his need. If he wanted to survive, he had to just beg and boldly beg for people to care for him and to give him money. And so we're told that they would lay him at the beautiful gate. That's not an official name of one of the temple gates. We don't know for certain which gate that this one is, although we have an idea it may be called the, the, it actually may be a reference to the Nicanor Gate, which was the main eastern entrance to the temple ground. Josephus, the ancient historian, writes about this gate. He says it was made from Corinthian brass, and in fact, it was greatly excelling those gates that were covered with silver and gold. This gate was 75 feet tall, and it had double doors. It was beautiful. It was majestic. It was magnificent. So this is the setting. I want you to take note of all the language that's coming up, the seeing language, okay? S-E-E-I-N-G. Look at verse 3. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. So this man, he sees the apostles. He sees Peter and John. He asks them for money, for charity. And remember, this is how he survived, right? His existence depended on the generosity of strangers. Look at verse 4. And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and they said, look at us. Look at us. So I'm, I'm fascinated by Luke's use of language here, because in the Gospels and including in Acts, when you read about these miracles recorded in Scripture, it's important for us to take note of the details involved in the miracles. Because as I mentioned, I think in John's gospel, Jesus could heal anybody any way that he wanted to. Right? He could just think a thought and boom, healed. Right? But often there's a process that the apostles, or that Jesus would intentionally go through to bring about healing. And in the process, usually some deeper truth is being communicated in the way the person is being healed. Right. So Luke says Peter and John gazed at this man. They gazed at this man. The word has the idea of staring at or looking intently at him. And right away, that probably would have startled him. 
Why would that be startling to this beggar? Well, let me just ask you, what's the common reaction here? Even today, if somebody is begging for money, and you don't intend on giving them any money, you do your best to not make eye contact with them. You want to see through them. You want to ignore them. They're invisible, right? Isn't that, that's what we do, and that's what most people do. When somebody's begging for money, they ignore that person. They look right through them, whether that's fear driving that or indifference, apathy, guilt, I, whatever, right? That is the common reaction. So someone like this man would have gotten very used to people just looking past him and ignoring him. But Peter and John don't do that. They fix their eyes on him. But not only that, what's, what's the first thing they say to him? This is fascinating too. They say, look at us. We're looking at you. Now look at us. And it's given as a command. It's an imperative in the Greek. He, they're ordering him, look at us, right? So not only do they fix their eyes on this lame man, but they're inviting him to look at them, right? The implication is that this man probably was in the habit of asking people for money, but probably not in the habit of actually looking at the people. You think, why would he be doing that? Why is he not looking? Well, uh, probably for a few reasons, probably out of shame or fear or indifference because he's ignored by 95% of the people who walk past. And so either way, Peter and John are interested in helping, but they do so in a way that recognizes this man's dignity and worth. They want to engage with him. They look at him, they invite him to look back at them. And look at verse 5. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. So, so he listens to Peter and John. He's giving his attention to them because why? Nobody talks to me like this unless they're going to open up their wallet. Right? No, nobody wants me to look at them unless they're actually going to do something that they want me to see. Right? That, that's what's happening here. People don't talk to him. People don't encourage him unless they're going to help him. And so look at verse 6. Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Now, I, I love how Luke describes this. Peter begins with the words silver and gold. Those are the first words in the sentence. And I'm sure that immediately got the guy's hopes up, right? Silver, silver and gold. He was expecting something from Peter and John. Now, imagine his disappointment as they kept talking, right? Because Peter literally says, it says in the Greek, silver and gold does not exist to me. That, that's the literal reading, or wooden reading of the Greek. Silver and gold does not exist to me. Isn't that a statement? First of all, it tells us a little bit about the poverty of the apostles, Right? Uh, this is the last thing the guy wants to hear. Peter's basically saying, we're as broke as you are. That's where they're at financially, right? Peter, silver and gold does not exist for me. We're poor too, but Peter's not finished, all right? He may not have silver and gold, but he has something better, far better than what the man is looking for, and, and it's not his fault, right? This, is, this beggar has been trained by the world to ask for an inferior kind of charity. That the world has trained this man that the charity he's asking for, this money, is the best he could get. He's been trained on the wrong kind of, of giving. And, G and Peter is going to say, we, got, we have something far better. And so Peter says, I have no silver or gold, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And so Peter commands, it's another imperative, he commands a man to get up, to rise up, and to walk, but he does not do it in his own strength, his own power. He says what? In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. What does that mean that Peter is saying, I'm doing this in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth? What does that mean? It means that Peter is invoking the power, the presence, and the authority of Jesus to heal this man. Okay, Peter's not attempting this on his own. Peter's done lots of things on his own power already. He's learned it doesn't work well, right? And so he's invoking the power, the presence, the authority of Jesus. He's deferring to Jesus and his power for this miracle. And so often this pattern 
we see in the Gospels, did Jesus invoke anybody's power when he healed somebody? He healed in his own authority. Do you remember the story of the guy who was also lame, who his friends brought, they opened up the roof and they lowered him down? Do you remember what Jesus said? Jesus didn't tell him he was healed. He he said, your sins are forgiven. And everybody was mad. He said, this guy can't say that. Only God has the authority to forgive somebody's sins. And what did Jesus say? To show you that I have the authority, not just to heal this guy, but to forgive his sins. I'm going to tell him to get up and walk to show you I can do both. And he commanded the man and he got up. And so Jesus performed miracles in his own authority and power. Peter and the the apostles, no, right? Not their own, but they're pointing to Christ. And this is important because it's showing the early church was anchoring itself to Christ and his power. And by the way, anytime the church fades away from that and stops anchoring itself in the power of Jesus Christ, that's when we all fall apart and get into trouble. Grant Osborne writes this. He says, the primary theme of this entire section is the power of Jesus' name. It's clearly not Peter and John who heal this man, but Jesus. And this will be reiterated in verse 16, when in his sermon, Peter states it was by faith in the name of Jesus that he had been healed. It is not magic, but divine power behind the healing. People cannot invoke Jesus' name as a magic word or an incantation and expect astounding miracles to happen. Have you ever experienced people talking like that? By the name of Jesus, I declare, right? And we try to use his name like it's some kind of magic abracadabra word. And that something's going to happen just like that, like he's a genie in the bottle. In fact, Luke, in the book of Acts, is going to tell us it doesn't work that way. And in Acts chapter 19, we see this this with the sons of Sceva. You guys remember the sons of Sceva? If you're not familiar with them, it's really a fascinating story. Uh, The sons of Sceva were itinerant Jewish exorcists. And so they would go from town to town casting out demons. And they got super impressed when they saw Paul in the name and power of Jesus healing people and casting out demons. And so what did the sons of Sceva do? They start, they say, hey, it's working for Paul. Let's just try to throw this Jesus guy around, like this name, right? And so they began to try to cast out demons in the name of Jesus, whom Paul proclaims. And does anybody know what happened to him? Uh, one of the evil spirits answered back when they tried this, Jesus I know, and Paul I recognize, but who are you? And then a reverse exorcism basically happens, where the evil spirit leaps on them, overpowers them, and causes them to run out of the house naked and wounded. What's, what's the point? The point is, just making pronouncements in the name of Jesus is not some kind of magical incantation. Jesus is not your personal genie in a bottle to do your bidding and to perform whatever miracles you think he should do. Jesus invested his power and his authority in his apostles and to his church for the purpose of making disciples. And that's why he invested his power and his authority in his people. But notice what happens next. After Peter commands the man to get up, look at verse 7. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. So Peter reaches out to this man with his right hand and raises him up, and we're told that immediately, the, the healing is instant, His feet and his ankles were made strong. This was a man who had never walked in his entire life. This was a man who did not have muscles where there should have been muscles. This is a man whose muscles would have been completely atrophied. Okay? And Thomas Walker makes a comment here that's really important for us to chew on that has a lot of significance. He says this, The power was Christ's, but the hand was Peter's. The power was Christ's, 
but the hand was Peter's. I, I read that and it struck me and how great of a description of that is, is, is Christian ministry and what we do as believers here in the church, right, in sharing the gospel with somebody. We don't have the power to save a soul. We don't have the power to forgive sins. The power and authority belongs only to Jesus. Yet, he has called on us to do what? Extend our hand to the poor, to the needy, to the lost, and share the love of Jesus Christ with them. And when we do that, we are continuing the ministry of Jesus in this world. The power is Christ. The hands are ours. Why did Peter do this? What, what led him? Did, did Jesus give him a healing manual and say, hey, Peter, in this situation, under these circumstances, give the guy your hand. What do you think? Did they get such a manual? I, I don't think so. What, what would lead Peter to reach out his right hand and pull this guy up? We could say it was love. We could say a lot of things. But one thing we know for sure is it's something he saw Jesus do. Do you remember when Jairus was concerned about his little daughter, his 12-year-old daughter, who was deathly sick and eventually died. And when Jesus went to heal her, who did he take with him? There was only three of the disciples. It was Peter, James, and John. And everybody was mourning, and Jesus said, why are you crying? She's not dead, she's asleep. And then everybody went from crying to laughing. They thought, this guy's a fool. And then Jesus reached out his hand and picked up that little girl's hand and said, little girl, arise. And instantly, she got up. He brought her back from the dead, right? And so, this is something Peter saw. He saw Jesus do this. You think that left an impression on Peter and John? I'd say say so. so. So what's clear here is that even though Jesus ascended to the Father, he sent his Holy Spirit to his people, and his ministry continues and 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 we are the more poorer as christians if we think it's any different today the power the ministry of jesus christ is still going on today in his church we're not apostles okay these miracles were important for the foundation of the church for the formation of the new testament but jesus is still performing miracles through his church today any time a sinner is awakened to their need and cries out to Jesus for forgiveness, that's a miracle of Jesus Christ raising the dead. And so he continues that work in us and through us today. This leads us to a second lesson we learn from the church's first post-ascension miracle, and that is Jesus' identity is confirmed. His identity is confirmed. Now, if we study the Gospels, you know that Jesus' identity had been confirmed in many ways. It was confirmed through his ministry. It was confirmed in his death. It was confirmed in his resurrection. It was confirmed in his ascension. In fact, Peter's first sermon that we studied hammered home the truth that Jesus Christ was Messiah and he was Lord. But, as humans, we're slow to understand things, right? And, And so we're reminded of two important truths here. We are slow to understand truth, and God is patient with our slowness. He's very gracious, right? So I want you to notice something about this miracle here in verse 8. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. So when Jesus heals someone, he doesn't do it halfway, right? This man was born unable to walk, and now in an instant, he's not just walking, he's leaping he's leaping and praising god and so unlike human healing jesus requires zero physical therapy okay zero rehabilitation it's instant it's complete it's full there's no you imagine jesus saying all right now do these exercises these squat thrusts for the next month you know no 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 it's you're full you're the way you were meant to be I want you to notice the word leaping here. That word is important because it's actually a rare Greek word in the New Testament. But it is the same exact Greek word used in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. And it's the same Greek word that I read earlier in Isaiah chapter 35, verse 6. Do you remember 
what was said there. It was talking about the coming of God to save his people and and how the blind were going to see and the deaf were going to hear and the lame were going to leap, right? And what we're seeing here is that fulfillment was happening in and through the ministry of Jesus. Do you remember in the Gospels when John the Baptist was arrested? He was in prison and he got nervous because John is saying, is this how things are supposed to happen? Am I supposed to be in jail? And so he sent his disciples to go ask Jesus a question. Remember the question? The question was, are you the Messiah? Are you the one? Or should we be looking for somebody else? Do you remember how Jesus answered him? He, he answered, but kind of in a non-direct way. Jesus says this, and this is from Matthew. Jesus replied, go and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and good news is preached to the poor. So Jesus is saying, yes, yes, John, I am the one. These miracles are testifying to my identity that I'm the one. I am God come in the flesh who's healing you who's restoring the world the way it was meant to be, the way it was before the curse. That's what Jesus was doing. He's alluding to Isaiah 35 and Isaiah 61 and Isaiah 62. And so this is just the latest of the countless confirmations that Jesus is the Christ, he's the Messiah, he's the Son of God, he's the only way of salvation. So this guy's happy now. He's jumping around. He's in the temple. He's praising God. Do you think people noticed? What do you think? They did. They did. Look at verses 9 and 10. And all the people saw him walking and praising God and recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what God had, what had happened to him. So this man, he's over 40. So we could assume maybe, maybe not as an early young child, but it's safe to assume that this man had been begging at that temple for the better part of over 30 years. Day after day after day. 30 years. This is not a long con, okay? This is not a 30-plus year to plan to fool people, right? He was truly, miraculously, completely healed through the power of Jesus Christ. And this caused the people there to be filled with wonder and amazement over what happened. That wonder and amazement, they're synonyms, they're describing astonishment. The second word for amazement is actually the Greek word ecstasis. Ecstasis, it's where our English word ecstasy comes from. And one Greek lexicon describes this word as abnormal condition of mind in which the subject passes out of his usual self-control. That's how the people were responding to seeing this man who had been lame all of his life, who had been begging for over 30 years, now suddenly leaping and rejoicing. And so this is going to lead for an opportunity. And what we're going to see next week is Peter is going to get used this. Everybody's stirring. Everybody's buzzing. And Peter is going to get up and preach his second sermon. But also, not only will this lead to Peter's second sermon, it is going to lead to persecution in the church. Isn't it amazing that something good and great will lead to persecution? Study the life of Jesus. That's what happens, right? And we, we can and should expect the same. The, that second lesson of this miracle is the confirmation of Jesus' identity. There's a third lesson here, and that is that Jesus' gospel transforms. Jesus' gospel transforms. So we affirm completely this miracle was historic and actually took place as Luke records. Yet, often in the scriptures, in the Gospels, and even in the Old Testament, miracles have a dual function. And they record actual history, but they also teach us something deeper of spiritual truth. Okay? What else does this miracle communicate to us about spiritual truth? Well, this miracle is a parable of the Gospel. Okay? It's a parallel of how any of us are saved. This beggar was born lame. He was paralyzed from birth. What does God tell us about our spiritual condition from birth? That we are born in our sins. 
that we're spiritually paralyzed, right? We're all born into this world as sinners. No exceptions, all of us. We're all born that way. Sin makes us helpless. Sin paralyzes us. But also, I want you to think about this man's condition. His own flesh failed him, right? He couldn't just simply fix himself. He couldn't heal himself. And the world is trying to help him, but all the best they can do is just give him alms, right? Just give him money. That's all they could do. And that's all the world can ever do for us, is they could heal us lightly. But they can never heal us to the root of our core problem. They can help alleviate our condition a little, but the world cannot touch our greatest and deeper need, this need. They just can't. Welsh preacher D. Martin Lloyd-Jones is really helpful here. He says, look at, look at it in every respect. Political, social, educational, entertainment. It is full of people exerting themselves and using their abilities in every conceivable direction. But from the standpoint of humanity's real and ultimate need, all of it is nothing but the giving of alms. It really does not touch our vital problem. It does not help us at all. Our sin makes us all helpless. And the world does its best to heal us, right? The, the world gives us alms to alleviate our problems, but they can't really get to the root of our problems. And so life distresses us, so where do we run? We're going to run to things like entertainment and politics and education and philosophy. And what happens? Well, it helps us for a little bit, right? For a little while. It helps us forget our problem for a little bit. But when it's over, we need more alms, right? Because they run out pretty quick. The entertainment runs out pretty quick, all right? Those other answers that the world has, they all run out pretty quick. We're not satisfied. We're still paralyzed by our root problem, which was not addressed. What does the church have that makes us different? What does the church have to get to the root relief? of our core problem. You see, the world thinks, just give them more money, give them more alms, that'll fix it. Jesus has something far better, something far greater to solve our problem. And what is it? It's himself. He gave himself. He died in our place. He bore our sins. He conquered the grave. He gives us liberation from our paralysis. He pulls us up to our feet and he enables us to leap around like a deer, full of joy. And Jesus and Jesus alone can solve our worst problem, our root problem. Lloyd-Jones says this. Do you simply go to church to get temporary relief, to forget your troubles and to feel happier for a moment? God have mercy upon you if you do. No, the business of the church is to deal with the real problem of men and women, not to give alms, but to offer a cure for the paralysis. This is the unique message of the church and differentiates it from every other institution under the sun. The church is an expert of the soul. We, as the people of God, have been given the radical and complete cure for humanity's lost and broken condition. And that cure is Jesus Christ. And we have the authority to offer people forgiveness in his name. And we have the authority to offer people assurance for eternity in his name. And we can say, like Peter and John, silver and gold doesn't exist for us, right? We, we, we're as broke as you are, but what we have is far better. We have Jesus Christ. And if you believe on the Lord Jesus, turning from your sins, you will be set free. You will be healed. And if you have received the forgiveness of sins that Jesus offers, if you've been healed from your paralysis, guess what you get to do? You get to walk around like Peter and John, right? Offering your hand to people who are poor and who are lost and who need help. We don't fix the world by throwing money at its problems. The world gets fixed only by turning to Jesus Christ in faith. That's it. And if we extend our hands to the lost and pray that Jesus will bring them back to life again, he will heal them. He can heal them, and he is still healing people. And, and so here we see the work of Jesus in and through his church. 
he continues his work. He confirms that he is the Messiah, that he is the Savior of the world. And he uses us, his church, his people, to do what? Extend our hands out, offering people forgiveness of their sins and the only cure that could save their lives, and it's the Lord Jesus. Let's pray. Father God, we praise you for this example of the power of Jesus Christ working through his church. We pray and ask, Lord, will you use us in a like way to extend our hands to those who are lost, to those who are hurting, those who are paralyzed in their sins, to offer them the only cure, something far greater than silver and gold, something that can truly heal and liberate them. Lord, we have the greatest news in all the world. Lord, use us to spread that news to others. Father God, change us and transform us to be more like Jesus. We pray this all in Christ's name. Amen.